Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to today's 75 minute panel discussion hosted by the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce or CANWCC as we will probably refer to it throughout this talk. CANWCC is the first and only Chamber of Commerce for women identified and non-binary business owners in Canada. As a Chamber of Commerce, we represent your needs with the government and our position and title as a Chamber give us access to the people who impact change. We exist to improve the quality of life for the over 1 million entrepreneurial Canadian women through advocacy with policymakers, and we aim to build a healthier and more inclusive Canadian economy. We are a nationally incorporated not-for-profit organization dedicated to equity, advancement, and connection. And we do this through our advocacy and through our membership and community programming. Our advocacy is centered around a single issue, economic equity. And we believe that economic equity is a human right. Our primary advocacy objective is access to capital and all of that, what that entails for women and non-binary entrepreneurs. Our free community is for allies and entrepreneurs to connect and find resources. And our business membership provides a landing place and growth hub for women identified entrepreneurs and organizations that are at least 50% woman owned and led. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, our advocacy and our membership, please visit us at canwcc.ca. My name is Jenna Clockley. And I am the director of community with the Canadian and uh, membership, sorry, with the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. My pronouns are she, her, and I welcome you to this panel today from the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Cree, the OJ Cree, the Dakota and Denny peoples, and home to the Métis Nation covered in Treaty 1, colonially known as Winnipeg, Manitoba, where we are refusing to search our dumps for the bodies of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and where we need all levels of government to come together to tackle this important issue. The Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce operates on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in what is colonially known as Toronto, Ontario. If you haven't already, Please feel free to introduce yourself, share your pronouns, your organization, and the land that you are joining us from today in the chat. And if you need support on the land that you're on, you can learn more about the stewardship and treaties connected to where you're situated by visiting native-land.ca. Now, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. We will be posting your questions directly to the panel. So please use the chat to ask any questions as they come up for you, and we will capture them. Paula Fletcher is here from the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce, and she'll be engaging with you in the chat today, so she'll be capturing your questions for us. And as we have time in the conversation, we will invite you to come off mute and participate openly with the panelists. But until that period, we ask that you stay on mute uh, and so we can hear the panelists clearly. And we have purposely chosen a meeting style event so you can all see each other and be active in the conversation. I will be spotlighting the panelists uh, so they should show up at the top of your screen if you're on full screen, uh, and you'll be able to see them all. And today's event is recorded, and we will be sharing a recording after the event. So let's get started. What we are seeing right now is one of the biggest shifts in the history of the world in generative AI. It will change the way we interact with each other, the way we do business, and the way we deliver goods and services. As we witness the remarkable advancements in AI, it's crucial that we shine a light on the potential biases that can seep into these systems and out of them. One recent report out of the US states that 79% of working women, which represents about 59 million workers, are in occupations susceptible to disruption and automation, compared to only 58% of working men. And when you think about it, it's a lot easier right now to automate knowledge work than it is to automate trades work. And many of those occupations are more male dominated. And to be honest, I went to chat GPT and I asked it to write this opening and it came up with a great paragraph that supports the reason that we're doing this. And here it is. According to recent studies, AI powered systems have exhibited glaring disparities in their treatment of different races and genders. In facial recognition technology, for instance, research has shown that the darker skinned individuals and women are disproportionately misidentified, leading to potential misidentification, wrongful accusations, and erosion of personal privacy. 
So when I asked ChatGPT to cite its sources for the previous statement, uh, it told me, I apologize for any confusion caused. As an AI language model, I don't have direct access to real-time data or the ability to browse the internet. The mention of recent studies and specific statistics in my previous response were meant for illustrative purposes. So it went on to tell me that if I needed to get the info or up to date, I should search reputable academic platforms, research journals, <laughs> or consult with experts, which we're doing today. So my question is, where did AI generate that paragraph from? If they're not searching the internet, it means it's being inputted. But from where and who is inputting it? The World Economic Forum notes that it is not a woman's perspective inputted. Their most recent gender gap report states, when it comes to artificial intelligence specifically, talent availability overall has surged, increasing six times between 2016 and 2022. Yet female representation in AI is progressing very slowly. The percentage of women working in AI today is approximately 30%, roughly four percentage points higher than it was in 2016. And I didn't see any statistics for people of color, indigenous, or other members of the global majority participating in the development of AI cited in this report. Another set of perspectives that have been historically and continually disenfranchised. An article from Mina FN cites Black artists using AI today have to work harder than their white counterparts to get results they feel that accurately represent them. And examples of this are some of the things I already talked about, like face and body distortions, definitions of features, um, and inability to recognize cultural references like types of braids or attire. AI represents an opportunity and a threat all at once. And we must be mindful of where we are going and who could be left behind. And with that, I am thrilled to have these experts here today and to introduce them to you and the moderator who will share their perspectives on the bias of AI, its threats and opportunities. PK Much is an indie media entrepreneur, freelance journalist, and a member of the Canadian Journalists, uh, Canadian Association of Journalists and the CanWCC Board of Directors, a former book publishing executive, zine maker, and startup professional. In 2018, she was the recipient of inspiring top 50 women in STEM. She was also profiled in Canada's 150 Women, Conversations with Leaders, Champions, and Luminaries. PK is the founder of Highwire Collective, formerly Evolution, and Lizbeth Media, and which was recently acquired by Rabble.ca. PK works to advance inclusive, non-extractive, non-exploitive, entrepreneurship and innovation and public policy and startup ecosystems with a particular emphasis on gender equity. Alice Enders is the head of research at Enders Analysis. She undertakes landmark research on the challenges and opportunities for creative industries in the digital age. Alice supplies consultancy work on music, licensing and B2B media. She is a former senior economist with the World Trade Organization and was a professor of economics at York University. Alice holds a doctorate in economics from Queen's University. And Dina Kamal. Dina is a partner at Deloitte Canada. She currently leads Deloitte's, Deloitte Canada's software and products portfolio to enable Deloitte clients with leading edge solutions in Canada and across the world. With strong expertise in AI and analytics, risk management, and cybersecurity, she has a track record of launching new services and products across diverse teams and ge geographies. An engineer by education, a senior, a seasoned business leader, and a new service team and products builder by experience, Dina is an economist in training. Moderating the conversation today is journalist Kylie Adair. Kylie is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in the Globe and Mail, Ravel.ca, and Future of Good. Before going freelance earlier this year, Kylie worked as an editor at Future of Good, a digital publication covering Canada's charitable and social purpose sectors. Kylie also worked on the 2016 feature Dream Girl, which showcased the lives of women entrepreneurs and premiered at the Obama White House. Kylie holds a degree in journalism and human rights from Carleton University and focuses her writing on social and economic justice. Welcome, panelists. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, and thank you to CanWCC for having me here today. Um, I'm joining this conversation from Montreal, which is the traditional territory of the Genyan Gahaga. Um, and this is newly my home, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be on this land. 
And welcome to our panelists. We have a lot to talk about today, so let's just dive right in. Um, so I wanted to start by sort of situating us in a very clear and concrete definition of what AI bias is. And Jenna did a beautiful job of presenting a lot of the research that is coming out around this. Um, but if you just want sort of like a standard definition for us to, or maybe not standard, but a, a clear definition for us to work with today, I found this one and it was the most sort of plain language one I could find online. <laughs> um, but it's by a writer named Zoe Larkin, um, and here is what Zoe writes. Machine learning bias, also known as algorithm bias or artificial intelligence bias, refers to the tendency of algorithms to reflect human biases. It is a phenomenon that arises when an algorithm delivers systematically biased results as a consequence of erroneous assumptions of the machine learning process. End quote. So yeah, as you can see, AI bias shows up in ways that are very similar to human biases. Um, it perpetuates gendered and racial stereotypes. It prioritizes Western culture and norms and values and so much more. Um, and I want us to start with some very real life examples of this. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share one example um, of the way AI bias shows up, perhaps in your work or just in the wider world that you wish more people knew about. Um, and maybe PK, we can start with you. Okay. Ah, uh, do I have to go first? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I guess in terms of, um, I don't know that this is a bias, but my example um, is a real one. Uh, it has to do with, AI, especially image-based AI, I know we're all talking about text AI, but image-based AI is really important as well. And about five, oh, four years ago, we kind of, I don't know, it's kind of hit the news more so now because of text AI, but, you know, that's been around for a long time to be able to do deep fake uh, illustrations. So about five years ago, I decided to uh, search on Google and say, what comes up when you Google me? And uh, I was really surprised to see my head on a pornographic series of photographs. And I think one of the things, so that's uh, one personal story around AI, um, and I'll leave space for other folks, but I think that when we're talking about impact on women and, you know, it's uh, how it affects uh, women and other gender diverse folks who are, who um, can be discriminated against and used, uh, that really shocked me. And I think that needs to be a big part of the conversation as well. And in fact, I did take a look and find out that um, something in the neighborhood of this, let me find it here. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, yeah, 96% of all deep fake videos are about non-consensual pornography. And recently there was a study that kind of looked at uh, uh, well-known websites where people post these kinds of things. And they found that there was only one video, a uh, fake video of a pre Try not to imagine this, President Trump in a pornographic situation. But um, there were uh, pages and pages and pages of his wife, Melania, and daughter, Ivanka. So women are being highly exploited in the pornography space uh, with the help of AI. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, PK, and for, for situating us in the, the reality that there's violence here, too. Um, thank you for that. Um, Dina, can you share an example of, of AI bias and how it shows up? I, I can give a couple of examples. I think one of them is uh, on uh, credit decisions. So all, all um, I would say all the financial institutions uh, over the past few years, they have certain scoring systems for um, you know, credit, um, uh, credit approvals, if you will. And uh, a lot of this is based on uh, uh, certain demographic data. Um, and uh, th there was uh, um, an example, actually, um, um, one of the executives as one of the banks, uh, again, he's an executive at the bank, his wife got rejected for a credit card at that exact same bank. Um, even though she shared the same household and, you know, all of that. Uh, so obviously he was uh, not very happy and obviously she got the credit card next day, but obviously also many women are not as lucky to be associated with an executive as a financial institutions. Um, so, so that's one example. The other example I will share is on hiring decisions. 
So uh, many organizations get a um, very large number of resumes and uh, they use a form of AI to do resume screening. And um, and um, and uh, depending on the keywords of how women uh, position themselves, and you know, and um, we, we've seen some or people actually from different demographic background or different uh, ethnic background or you know where they live and all of that, we've seen some potential discrimination there. Uh, so these are just maybe two examples that I think hit home for many of us on on this call. Thanks, Dina. And Alice, what, what are you thinking about in terms of an example? Oh, Alice, you're on mute. You know, so economists uh, with their models, they have this turn of phrase that Dina will be aware of, which is garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and uh, large language models are trained on the past. And if I was to change my job, or my gender, uh, I would not be identifiable by a model that was trained on the past. And so I would be trapped in an identity that is no longer my own or that I've chosen to have as my own, either personally or professionally. And the proliferation of large language models that are trained on the past and who you are yesterday means that you can no longer have a public identity that you yourself craft. And to me, that is a form of identity theft. So that is the thing that most affects me uh, when I look at everyday situations uh, and lots of people are encountering that as well. We're losing the right to craft our own identities online. Mm. That's so powerful. And I want to come back to this idea of how AI is trained and how it can only look backward um, in what it puts out. Um, but I want to just maybe continue on this thread of what we're seeing right now. So Dina, you mentioned a few um, sectors where it's particularly concerning to see bias in AI. Um, I wonder, Alice, if maybe you could give us a sense of other sectors as well, where AI is being integrated on a, on a wide scale and where bias is really concerning. No, I think, uh... You know, one of the things that we're talking about here is the fact that AI has been around for a while. Okay, it's not new. Okay, large language models and the open access chat GPT and so on. That's new. Uh, but the fact is, is that uh, automation or machine learning has been around for decades and it has progressively as we all become online denizens. Uh, we are, of course, subject to the uh, arbitration uh, with respect to credit cards, with respect to hiring, with respect to this, with respect to anything. Uh, businesses have deployed very, very widely uh, simplifications uh, in terms, uh, you know, because it's all about productivity. It's all about sifting resumes. It's all about, you know, and who cares really? Because people are just, uh, you know, interchangeable. Well. You know, I like to think that people are not interchangeable and they each have an identity that we should respect. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, to, to be honest, I mean, to me, ChatGPT is a major new threat because it is being deployed in uh, language based uh, tasks and so news media organizations are using it, advertising and marketing and so on. And I think it's, to be honest, it's robbing us of the creativity that is the real beauty of the human being. Um, because, you know, ideas are what have always progressed humankind. And we are robbing ourselves of being able to tap into the beauty of that creativity. And the echo chamber that results from ChatGPT is appalling. I mean, and I haven't even talked about music, okay? but um you know which is another or books or ai generated books you know and things like that and 
and you know i think the important thing so i personally i work in a very small company we have 30 employees um we do research we produce 120 reports a year and uh, they're premium product we're a b2b supplier and uh we cannot i think hopefully be disintermediated uh, by uh, chat GPT or similar types of tools because we use actually uh, our minds and our creativity and our teamwork. And I think for all the businesses out there uh, that are on this call that are female run uh, that uh, where, you know, which is, I mean, our business is a craft business, to be honest. Um, and I would like to preserve all the values that have made our business what it is. And I would be hard pressed to surrender them. And, but like I say, the echo chamber is what really worries me in the media in particular, because we will never progress conceptions of women and what they are and what they can be and how they choose to define themselves if we surrender to the past. We cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I wrote down, you know, this sort of paraphrase quote, which is, it's robbing us of the beauty of creativity. And it sounds to me like it's robbing us of the beauty of imagining a new way to be. And that brings us to this idea of um, how bias gets integrated into AI in the first place. Um, you know, especially given this sort of sales pitch that we get all the time that, you know, machines can sort of bypass all of this human error, like bias, like unconscious bias. I um, mean, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to just break it down. Like how, how does AI become biased? Um, Dina, do you want to share with us your thoughts on this? For sure. Uh, so happy to share that. I also want to be uh, not the contrarian because obviously I think we collectively and no one can deny that there is significant risk of bias in AI and you know, specifically generative AI like ChatGPT. I just want to be also careful and maybe I want to give some examples on the value of AI if it's done right. I think I think that's something we we need to be uh, to, to be also mindful of. So so. But before I talk about the, 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 the source of bias in AI, I think like any system in the world, you have an input and you have uh, some processing happening to that input and then you have the output. So, so we tend to call the AI a prediction machines. To, I think to the point that Alice and PK made, it uses some kind of existing data historic data, sometimes semi-real-time data to, and then it gets processed by uh, do, doing some kind of a modeling, if you will, processing of that data and then create an output. That output is what should be used to make certain decisions. And I give examples, you know, on the resume screening, we give some examples on writing an article, uh, you know, some example on credit decisions, but that judgment, that decisioning should always stay with the human. And the human should not just, because what we're, the, the problem we're seeing is, is, is that we as human, we're leaving the decisioning for the AI. We think the AI is smart, that it will give us the answer. The AI gives you a, a probability, a prediction, what you do with it, should mm -hmm. and stay with us on what to do with it. And like, I think um, there was some discussion of that, how the introduction today was used with, with ChatGPT. When I use ChatGPT for any content, I need to put on it my own judgment on, does it make sense, you know, does it flow, does it meet my requirements? It does allow me to accelerate a lot of my development of content, but it doesn't negate the human in the loop. So that's on the output piece. Now, going back to Alex's point on garbage in, garbage out, that, that goes to everything, you know? If you have, a, think about the AI as a little kid, as a, almost a toddler. If, it, if you put this toddler in a heavily racist environment where people use racist language and they have racist behavior, that toddler will learn from that and they will go up to behave like that. So the AI is really a toddler, <laughs> you know? 
So, so if we are giving the AI data that is based on, um, uh, you know, half representation of society or looking as a subset of society or looking at people that assuming that if you live in a certain neighborhood, then probably you are less worthy of X or if you have the background or you are a woman. So, 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 so making sure that we have representative data, I think is very important. So there is a bias on the data and I can, I, I, and I you know, give that toddler example, but then that model is modeling basically you kind of look at when I process the data, it's like when you're putting these ingredients, right? So let's say you're cooking, if you put too much salt or too much this or too much that, that will impact the output. So depending what am I putting more emphasis on? So for example, in hiring decision, historically, we look at people that have the, in an X company, because I don't want to get in trouble. In an X company, many companies, they look at people from certain universities with certain grades, certain, you know, this and that, and it ha they have to look like this and this and that, and, you know, certain genders and all of this. So, so our model looks for these attributes, for these features. But if we're changing the model to say, actually, don't care about the university. Let's care about their lived experience. You know, let's look at the variety of experience they have. Let's let's look at what they actually they know, you know, not what kind of gender they are, you know. So so that you know, in, in our in the AI model, what you're asking the model to put more emphasis on will influence what the model is giving us as an output, you know, because and I think PK, we had that chat earlier about. Should it be even called artificial intelligence? Is it even intelligent? And I'm like, no, you basically, you tell it to do something and it doesn't. And I'm going back to the echo chamber that Alice talked about, it is honestly an echo chamber because basically you, 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 you train it on massive set of data and try to give you an output that looks like the data you give it, it's just a bit more unique or a bit unique, but really based on what you told it before. You know, but again, it's like a toddler. You, you know, the toddler hears a few things and then God knows what they're going to say afterwards based on what their parents told them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, PK, any thoughts on this sort of idea of garbage in, garbage out, or the toddler analogy or the cooking analogy? I love all of these, all of these analogies, Dina. But yeah, what are your thoughts, PK? Yeah, I love this conversation because I was listening to some of the collision uh, talk, you know, the big tech conference in Toronto. I don't know if anybody went, but uh, there was so much existential hype about it, right? It's going to replace human beings. And the only people who wants to replace human beings is usually big business because human beings are expensive. So I'm like, I always ask myself, who actually wants this? Who wants to pay for it? And yes, I see the productivity side of it for sure, but that's not the side that's overhyped, right? The side that's hyped is that it's intelligent and it's kind of, uh, how should I say, arrogant of human beings to even suggest that their own understanding of intelligence is the only kind of intelligence out there. What would AI make of dolphin intelligence? Like we, we, we anyway, so I just find the whole framing of the AI conversation kind of weird right now. And here's why I, I think about that as well. Um, in the context of bias, everybody may remember Tay, Microsoft, the Tay Twitter, beautiful millennial bot that came out in 2017. And of course, within no time, it was a learning, uh, it's not a text bot, but it was a learn, it was learning from social media. And of course, uh, if you remember, it started spewing out hate and all kinds of racist stuff, like in no time, Microsoft had to take it down. And here's the interesting fact about the development of Tay, which was it was a 50-50 a gender team that created it. Like they were trying to avoid bias. So what does that tell us about, you know, it, it, you know, is more women in AI actually going to have an impact? So that's a question I come up with in thinking about that. So I also think it's unusual that um, that this was back in 2017, as Alice mentioned, AI has been around for a long time. So why all the sudden hype now around? And I know it has to do with the new, as you've just mentioned, but um, I always feel like there's a predictable, speaking of predictive predictive stuff cycle to these hyped conversations 
And I don't want to diminish its uh, dangers, and we can talk about that later. But yeah, that's just what I, I just want us to remember Tay, which was eight years ago, and we had the same conversations then. And what has changed between then and now, other than another, you know, version or evolution of the technology that produced Tay? Hmm. So maybe I'll, I'll pose that question to, to Dina or Alice, whoever wants to take it, but why are we talking about this right now? Why does all of this matter? You know, especially in, in the context of, you know, we're talking about biased AI as a reflection of human bias, um, as simply a reflection of what we think and we feel. So why is AI on its own and the biases that it puts out, why is that something to be concerned about? So if I can just take that question, um, and I just want to echo Dina first of enforcement, you know, for, you know, which is to say, you know, one of the areas where AI is really going to revolutionize women's lives is in diagnostics, mm -hmm. uh, breast cancer, and so on. And uh, that is to me, uh, the, and, and that, uh, you know, we've been hearing about that for, for quite, quite a while. And um, and I think that's incredibly valuable because, um, you know, well, I mean, the point is, you know, saving lives is to me the most important purpose of human progress. So I just want to say, first off, yes, uh, and and those advances have been around for a while, and they have been, you know, widely publicized, and you know, hopefully they get into our health system sooner or later. Uh, but why are we talking about AI? And we are talking about AI because of OpenAI, the company which is uh, co-owned by Elon Musk and Sam Altman, and their uh, desire to swamp the world with a, a tool called ChatGPT, and which is freely available without charge, although now they've introduced a subscription tier as of February, because, you know, guess what? In the world of tech, it's users first, revenue second. So they are swamping the English speaking world with an English language tool. And this is actually quite important because when you think of China, uh, you know, China has Mandarin based AI tools that are quite similar and they're being deployed in search engines in China and so on. So, you know, I just want to position this that, you know, we're English you know, okay, I'm also a Francophone, if I may say, but I will not burst into French right at this minute. Uh, but but that is another application where AI has been extraordinarily useful. And uh, I've noticed it myself because uh, you, if you use Google Translate for French to English, you will see there have been major improvements. However, as a Francophone, I always have to check the text because I know that there will be little things that are not quite right. Uh, but the point is, is that we have in the hands of whoever wants, you know, as we know, chat GPT, okay, it, you know, whatever, we have threads from Facebook uh, one day and so on. But the point is, it has scored really high. Uh, but it has sort of obscured a lot of free tools around image. Uh, so text to audio, text to image. Uh, but the point is, is that all language based tools, the beauty of our language, poetry, books, are said to be disintermediated by ChatGPT, who will write you a stupid sounding poem uh, at the drop of a hat. So we have in the hands of people this free tool. Now, I say it is currently free, but I wonder how long it will be free. But the idea is to create an addiction to this tool because it's free and swamp the english speaking world with these uh llm you know chat gpt and of course there's other stuff to come uh you know uh, so so we have apis on the way and whatever you know we have a developer community that's going to hive on to chat gpt and create all sorts of applications around this llm which is past, which is trained on the past. So that's why we're talking about it. And then, of course, every business which has been using AI for a million years has had to come out and say, hey, we're an AI business. You know, we've been an AI business forever. In, we in, integrate 
AI, machine learning, into our internal business processes. But all shareholders and stakeholders and everybody, all they want to hear is the brand association uh, with AI. Like, to give you an example, um, Lucian Grange, who's head of Universal Music Group, said, you know, and that's a music company. Okay, music, you know, he said, we are an AI driven company. <laughs> like, it's not like they don't make, they make money from music. <laughs> and AI has a very limited role to play in music. And it is very much more of a threat than an opportunity. But I'm just saying, it has just become flavor of the month. And so I go to Petra's point. It's a hype cycle. We're part of a hype cycle. And Sam Altman has, I don't know if you guys have seen the mission statement of OpenAI, but it is to disintermediate every economically valuable activity done by human beings. Now, I don't know about you, I'm an economist, and I look at consumption, weekly expenditure, and so on. And you know, people take transport. They have lunch and dinner. Uh, they cook for themselves or they go out, they have lattes, they have this, they have that. When I think of this vision of disintermediating every single economically valuable economic activity by humans, I just burst out in laughter. I'm so sorry. It is <laughs> so absurd and it is so redolent to me uh, to the kinds of mission statements that tech companies have put out in the past you know, Google's do no evil, Facebook connect all of humanity. These are all capitalist projects. And that is why chat GPT will not be free forever. Okay, that's just very simple. So it's just about building market share, preventing any other competitor from hoovering up, because all of this involves capital. But of course, chat GPT has a open AI has a very important um, you know, collaboration, partnership with Microsoft. And that's very important because that means that all the productivity enhancements in ChatGPT will be built into the business tools that most of us use in our businesses. And, you know, within your audience, they're all businesses as well. So, you know, as I say, there is a positive and negative thing, but there is definitely, we're, we're on the surf part of the hype wave in the biggest uh, possible way, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I have a, yeah, so should I put my little hand down? Yeah, totally, uh, uh, totally with you on that, Alice. And I think that's important to raise in our collective understanding about what's going on right now. So uh, I, I sort of, in the venture capital space, there's this phenomenon of the bigger, better fool, right? So the way you make money in venture capital is you get in early and then sell the heck out of it so that the next fool is a little bigger than you, buys you out, and then you get your big bucks and then there's the next bigger fool. So there's this like, that's sort of the, the ladder that happens. And right now people are starting to go, oh, wait a second. Uh, you know, maybe, I, I, maybe it's already gone, right? Maybe the early VC cycle on that will, and maybe that will hype it down. I love your, um, ex, you know, the, the fact that it is a business model. And I wonder, uh, as we talked about uh, AI, the name artificial intelligence, Let's talk about screen readers for a second and intelligence that supports disabled folks do their work and their thinking. What if AI chat GPT was called an assistive device and not artificial intelligence? And I personally, as a creator and content maker and publisher, see it as an assistive device, not as intelligence. Then it wouldn't be as sexy, would it? <laughs> we wouldn't be saying it's going to take over the world because, uh, you know, we've got so much assistance, we don't know what to do with it. Um, yeah, but I find that uh, the whole language is deliberate around this. Maybe it used to be called AI, as you mentioned, five, you know, fifth, been around for a long time. But that was kind of more computer thinking around what intelligence is. And calculators were early AI. <laughs> so um, I think it's really deliberate to cause all these conversations around our existential future and fear and all of these things, instead of getting to the real nut of it, which is here's another technological thing and it will lose people jobs. And yes, women will be disproportionately hit about that because of the nature of the jobs they have. 
there will be new opportunities and everybody will quietly integrate it into their lives over, you know, like social media over 10 or 15 years, just like we quietly integrated calculators. I'm old enough to remember the big brouhaha with calculators and uh, other sorts of brouhaha's over new ideas and the hype cycle and, and people kind of fighting back. One last thing I'll say about that is I, I find that technology, uh, the, the creators of open text AI uh, are of a particular technology viewpoint. And that is of the, I, I once, um, I hung out in the futurist world for like a year. I was a member of that. So what struck me about that is how, A, it was totally male dominated out of like 200 members of this one particular project where I was in, there were like four women, I was one of them. And all these people, males, wanted to get rid of their bodies. It's like a fetishism of, of disembodiment and disconnection from the human side of things. And I don't know why that is. I actually asked a few of my male friends and they said, well, because you know, we our bodies are substandard to women's bodies. They can do so many more things and we're afraid of that. So we just wanna get rid of our bodies, focus everything on the head and then we'll be fine. So I think there's a conversation to be had too around technology being uh, developed mostly by men and this fetishism of disembodiment and disrespect of what humanness means. That is fascinating, and I'm going to do more reading about that because what a fascinating idea. Um, thank you, PK. But before we move on to, um, and PK, I like this, this framing of, um, you know, this isn't just something that is happening to us. Um, it's actually something we get to play a part in and we get to participate in. And I want to get to that in a bit, which is um, how we can sort of shape this, this, new, uh, this new era. Um, but first, I just want to really zero in on how bias in AI might affect women and non-binary entrepreneurs. And this is where I'll call on anyone in the audience who hasn't shared a question in the chat. If you have a question about how biased AI might impact your work, just add it to the chat and we'll, we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, our panelists, um, why does biased AI matter specifically to women and non-binary entrepreneurs? Um, are there ways that it affects their access to capital um, or their marketing or just their work in any other way? Um, what, should, what should everyone here today be aware of? Uh, can I just uh, talk more generally about the issue uh, of women? Sure. Uh, we know that, and, and I'm just, taking a media perspective here. And we know that women have been underrepresented in culture for many years. Uh, when you think of the image of women that's conveyed by Hollywood films, for example, their stories, they're sexualized, uh, their stories are diminished, uh, they're not uh, leads, uh, I mean, Anybody who's been involved in the women's movement as long as I have knows that it we can only advance in our society in terms of the safety of women and respect for women from a position where we didn't have voting rights, hello, um, by uh, affirming women and their stories and reversing uh, the patriarchy's detrimental representation of women uh over many many years and i i'm sure all of us have more stories to tell about that uh, i'm an economist and i have to tell you uh, that at the first conference i went to uh which was many many years ago there was a bus driver and he said to me lady what are you doing on this bus and i said well i'm going to the conference center and he said but lady you don't belong on this bus we're not going to the airport you got to get off now because we're going to the conference center. But I am going to the conference center. No, you're not going to the conference center. And these images affect our children. They affect uh, the way men behave towards us. And I think all of us have been involved for years in giving women a proper voice, their voice, their right to have their own identity. And we live in still in the patriarchy our echo chambers are all around us and i've worked for years uh, with uh, tv companies advertising companies about the representation of women 
and also the breaking down of taboos, you know, such as the word menopause or the word vagina. And this is to me the primary risk is that we reverse all the effort, uh, you know, women in sports, but you know, uh, devalue. You know, we have we actually have made inch by inch, you know, progress, and all of that is going to be reversed if we say only the past counts. Because to be a progressive person and to put women out there that have stories and to break that is breaking down a barrier. And that to me is what it's all about. The bias of society against women, which is vehicled from generation to generation and robs women of motivation and ambition and role models they can aspire to emulate. And it's a huge, huge stake. I'm so sorry. Uh, it applies to many other people. Okay, you know, black people, whatever, you know, name it, you name it. We're all part of the same umbrella organization here. Uh, but, you know, I'm 65, you know, I've been around for decades and I have been uh, fighting so hard against the misrepresentation of women, uh, uh, including, you know, STEM, uh, whatever, you know, uh, my profession, etc. You know, this is very big. We can't lose sight of how important it is for us to plow on and reverse the patriarchy's representation of women in the media, in, in film, in, in books, in this and that and the other. We just cannot give this up. <laughs> Sorry, it was an emo moment. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. Uh, Dina PK, whoever wants to build on that. Thank you, Alice. Go ahead, Dina. Dina. What I mean, I agree. I want to. I want to say very loud. I agree. There is a but coming. So, and and, and the but is not is not like it's not like agree, but I don't agree. What what I'm trying to say is there is a lot of hype. We know that. And and I think with hype, there is an opportunity for all women because the reality of it is it's very new and the guys and you know are jumping on this trying to look smart and trying to progress in their career. So, I mean, we can play the same game. I think sometimes as women and non-binary people, we can feel intimidated by the technology. We can feel intimidated by our place in this. I think we can claim our place in this, you know? And I actually was asking, you know, like there are resources where you can really have a role in this and shape your career because notwithstanding the bias, because the reality of it is, it's just, it's a technology, you know? And we said, it's, it's, it's a human created, basically amplifying the biases that the society has already. So I'm always thinking that, you know, like, it, how, do we, how do we get the most of what we have with right now? You know, and I was saying, if there is, if there's a problem, there has to be an opportunity somewhere. And I'll give you an example. So I asked to share my screen. So I'm gonna share my screen with you if you allow me. And this is Coursera. I'm hoping you've seen Coursera before. So I basically wrote on Coursera artificial intelligence and I put beginner and in English, you can write French. The, these all, if not most of them are free courses on, on what is happening. So you can see there is ChatGPT for market research. There is, I think, something on AI for everyone. That doesn't make you um, um, uh, an expert in artificial intelligence or ChatGPT, but it makes you part of the dialogue. And when there's a dude trying to create some hype, you can outdo him and say, well, here is actually what's happening. And here is how I can use it for my job. Here is how I can use it in my business, you know? And, and maybe it's a contrary view, but I think, you know, 
and it goes back to your question, Kylie, on why it is so big right now, because it's being democratized. It's just so freely available. And at the other point, is it meant to be addictive? Perhaps. I mean, the same thing with all social media, you know? You, you want to do more of it, you know? So will it die out? I think elements of it will die out. Elements of it will not, because there is significant economic value for it. You know, and I want to give you one example I heard yesterday. It actually really hit home with me. So, um, so, so a few years ago, I think you folks heard about, maybe you heard about, there was this um, um, problem with the water in Flint, Michigan. And people were dying out of poisoning from the water coming from, from their taps. So what happened is, they, because there is lead in the pipes, so they had to, so the only thing they do it is basically go house by house, check the pipes in each house and see if it has lead and then replace. So you can imagine to do that in a city that could have taken months and months and months. So they end up creating an AI model to predict which of those houses will have lead pipes in it. And as you might imagine, most of those houses are in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. And when they did that, they were 80% accurate. But you know what happened is that the politics came in and the rich neighborhood said, oh, you don't come check our, our pipes. Maybe our pipes have lit in them. And we're like, but the AI said, we don't need to. It's like, no, 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 you have to check. So they stopped using the AI and using our own human judgment. And you know what ended up happening? They went down to 20% accuracy and a waste of time and a waste of resources. So, so this is just a silly example, uh, maybe not a silly example of when you use AI in the right way, you can get value, you know? So, so that's, and, I, and I, when I heard that example, I'm like, that's a very salient example. It's not replacing any one job. It just, it's basically allowing us to do what we're supposed to do in a better way if we feed it the right data and manage it the right way. So I think as, as women and non-binary folks, we just need to be thinking about this to our advantage. Alice, I'm sorry. I don't disagree with you, okay? Uh, there is so much improvement that we can make by optimizing the use of data. I mean, this is what I've done all my life, okay? But I'm talking about the risks to the representation of women in the media and the reversal algorithms. For example, you like this, you like that. There is no progression that is an echo chamber. And we are now surrounded by algorithms, uh, Netflix, uh, Kindle, uh, Amazon, I mean, on and on and on and on. And these, unfortunately, I think, do damage discovery. But as I say, the crucial thing for me is the representation of women by the media. That is what people can take home, right? It is what our girls grow up with, okay? And our boys, okay? They grow up with representations of society in their screens, their books, their classrooms, their societies as a whole. And that is the principal risk to me is that we, uh, you know, we know, okay, I live in the UK, um, Canada, I lived there for 12 years. It was a beautiful time, but then I came to the center of the patriarchy, uh, one of the other patriarchies, the US. You know, we know we're living in a very uh, polarized environment where there is a desire to not be a part of a progressive society. And uh, we see that the internet has been extraordinary for us in terms of widening language, but also in terms of creating very powerful pockets of prejudice that are out there and that want to take us down. And I know what it's like to be the subject of that kind of hostility because it has been a constant throughout my professional life. And I would not diminish the force of the patriarchy and prejudice and how chat GPT will be used to that end. I'm really sorry. Hey.
I want to sort of dive in on that and add another layer to that onion. I would agree, uh, Alice. And I think sometimes uh, the the narrative that is that count like when people when we say that a lot of people then say, oh, we just need more women working in AI. We need more women doing this. But the history has shown that the more you add women and stir, it doesn't actually change the system. And I want to just share a couple of important stats there. So when we're talking about content creation and language AI, which is, you know, the big thing is journalism writing and all that kind of thing, and also visual artists with DALI and Midjourney and all that. Um, so 75% of fine arts grads are women. Women actually are now like 51% of all arts working people. In the book publishing business, actually women have surpassed men in terms of the percentage of books published written by women. We got voices out there. They're just not being included or shown in a whole bunch of things. So adding women and encouraging them to join and become part of the AI scene doesn't secure a better future for us unless they're in control or there is some way to diminish the control of the patriarchy, so to speak. And I feel that what is not happening in the AI conversation as much is how do, you know, the efforts that women need to take and other folks who are marginalized by this technology and Elon Musk and company's version of this technology and who they access to build it and sell it to and all of that is, um, yeah, we need to do what we always do, which is, uh, you know, come together, advocate, uh, create regulation. Um, I'll just share a short story about the photocopier. Some of you may remember the photocopier and it was a big deal when photocopiers went into schools and schools used to have to buy books and do workbooks. And I'm coming from a publisher content point of view here. And uh, so now schools could publish, uh, basically rip off all the, like no copyright. There was no technology to track that and basically uh, not have reduced their material spend by significant force. Well, what happened? First of all, copyright was strengthened. In Canada, they created access copyright or formerly can copy so that schools had to pay a generalized license fee to can copy so that uh, creators could get paid. And yes, they use AI to decide how much everybody gets paid, um, but we have to sort of balance the technology with what we as the human beings want it to be. And I don't think companies are gonna do that for us. I think it has to be come from a legislative place and it has to be advocated for, and uh, it has the companies using this and extracting value from it have to be made to uh, share that uh, wealth that they're doing. And also just like can Canadian content laws, make sure, and I, maybe we're gonna have a gender content law in AI, but uh, to preserve that, you know, where AI needs to represent 50%, I'm just making this up now, of content coming from women, led women-based sources to ba ba balance it out. So I'll stop there, but saying, yeah, at women in STIR doesn't work. We need bigger tools, bigger power tools. I'll, I'll just say uh, to me, AI is productivity. It's also predatory and it's a power tool. Mm. We have two, I think, related questions um, from the audience. Um, and I think PK, you're starting to get into regulatory solutions and some sort of bigger structural solutions, but we have some questions around what we can each do individually. Um, because as you mentioned, Dina, this is something we all have agency in, we can participate, we can decide how we interact with it. So um, we have a question from Raksha, which is, what are your collective thoughts on how we can address these issues as they relate to AI? What can we individually do? So I'll just leave that one there. And then we have another question, which I'll pose to you, PK, um, as a journalist uh, from Corinne, which is, uh, there's a lot of hype around using AI to create course content, uh, which is relevant to what Corinne does specifically. Mm -hmm. Do you think creators should have to disclose if they have used AI to create content? So is this something that we can do to um, sort of manage the potential or mitigate the potential negative effects of, of AI individually? Yeah, do you want me to get into that? That'd be great, Answer yeah. Answer that question? Yeah, Corinne, I love your website, by the way. And a big shout out to the work that you do. Um, so in history, uh, women have normally been, we all have seen the movies, you know, hidden figures, da, 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 da. So in the feminist space, one of the core tenets and principles is acknowledgement, acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. And so I would suggest that one of the regulations has to be around, so of course, content, if you are borrowing someone else's content, 
Uh, it's your duty to figure out where that content came from if you are generating it out of AI and at least verify it and uh, give credit where credit is due. And I think that should be part of the, um, you know, part of the ethics of using content AI in creative work. So when, for example, I do a picture, because I understand why people want to do mid-journey or dally uh, illustrations as a publisher. I can get that picture of a monkey riding on a bicycle right now. I don't have to hire an illustrator, wait for three weeks and, you know, and, and all that stuff. And I don't have to pay much for it. But if I then realized that if I had to, uh, was forced by regulatory to disclose where that monkey was first painted and who painted the bike, which it mashed together and then disclosed. And I made companies actually make that transparent then disclose that this, this was AI generated image, but the content came from these three creators. And then I am billed a tax or I am billed something to pay those three creators. So part of the way we can fight back is an ethos of acknowledgement because it, it will erase and it erases, especially marginalized folks contributions to thinking content quicker than not even mentioning them at all and taking uh you know taking control and saying hey I'm, I'm the one who invented this idea and you know you know you weren't so i think there is that you can start practice everybody here can practice that now the other practice i want to suggest in terms of what can we do right now about this so i i used ai to create a, an illustration for one of uh, elizabeth's um articles uh, two months ago and I wanted to see what people would say. And it turned out nobody said anything, <laughs> but it's a clearly AI generated photo that it, or illustration, because you can see different mouths and you know it's a picture of women playing chess, but I could not, I tried for the life of me, it was a bit of an experiment to go back to where those original illustrations came from, could not. So the best thing I could do is I donated what I would normally pay an illustrator for that photo to a local arts organization. That was the best way I could come up. Now, I know that, you know, lots of people will say, well, I'm not doing that. But I think that we need to start thinking about those kinds of things and how do we build that into the use of the technology and the governance of it so that creators can be paid. And I just also want to mention, most creators are happy when you're using their work. They just want to get paid for it. And I work at OCAD and run the uh, an Arts Accelerator program there. They're planning on AI courses. A lot of creatives are, are looking at it as assistive technology, as I would say again, and play with it and see what it tells us about ourselves and other things. So artists aren't afraid of it, but what they're really afraid of is their work not, not getting paid for the output uh, that they are going to be created, even with assisted AI. Does that help as a strategy for how to, how to make that more fair? I think so. I think so. Let us know in the chat. But yeah, Dina, um, I saw you come off mute. What are you thinking in terms of what we can do now? I really love what people said. And there's an example of Grimes, who's a singer, who basically said, oh, you can use my voice however you want for AI-generated songs, as long as I get 50% of the royalties. You know, so she just put it out there. So fighting it, she's like, okay, I'll embrace it but I will get 50%. Um, but it's very hard, and I think to pick his point, it's very hard to track where that content uh, output came from, uh, because usually it's also not disclosed. I think I think for, for us on the call, I think one of the things, like I think what, and I, and I, I, and I really actually, I found what Pika said interesting that having more women at the table doesn't necessarily change the narrative. Yeah, unless you are senior enough, unless you're impactful enough, unless you're loud enough, and there needs to be a lot of us. So I think individually may not make a difference, but I think with enough women, hopefully at some point we can. But I think when I think about learning about the technology, understanding it, it just allows you to ask the right question allows you to, to challenge the status quo a bit more, allow you to push back, allow you when a bank, you know, give, doesn't get, or a VC or what have you, doesn't give you the answer you would expect to say, what is that based on, you know? Uh, allow you to understand how your data is being used and challenge that from a privacy perspective. So I think, I think it's important not to get intimidated by the technology and by the hype and just try to understand enough for us to 
use our voice to say that this makes sense. You know, especially when you have the flood of misinformation, the flood of misuse and, and all of that. So I think that understanding, I think, is a is a starting point and 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 just pushing for uh, for inclusion. What I will also say though is I think that discussion aligns with what is I'm optimistic. It's not there yet around ESG. So many organizations and I and I and if you forgive me, a lot of my perspectives come from the corporate, because that's where I spend a lot of my time. A lot of the corporates now publish these massive ESG reports. I'm like, okay, what is the S and that, you know? And I challenge actually some of the banks I work with. You, you talk about having this very strong social agenda. How are you supporting women entrepreneurs? How are your systems, you know, and the AI is developed? To make sure that you have this equity within a an organization and with your customers. So I think the, the more we have that kind of a push, if you will, to say, you talk about ESG, go to your board, ESG, this, ESG, that, and some of them have like a hundred page ESG report of how amazing they are. I'm like, but how, <laughs> how, yeah, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but how do you, but I'm like, okay, but what did that actually mean, you know? And how do, how do you use technology for good, if you will, you know, uh, to serve women and other uh, under, underrepresented, underserved um, um, groups in, in Canada and other ways. So if I can just uh, paraphrase Dina and Petra, knowledge is power. And I absolutely agree that to know as much as you can about AI, its productive uses for yourself and for other people in your community uh, is so important because, you know, we've had so much technology, you know, come down the pipeline and um, I'm fascinated by technology. You know, I grew up in a very old world. <laughs> There wasn't anything called data science at Queen's University when I was there. I might have done it instead of <laughs> No, it's true. I'm telling you, it was like an old world. And I I'm I just I think we should all embrace the new world. But as I say, knowledge is power. So I'm echoing you, Dina, which is uh, you know, as much as you know, it is not a threat unless you let it become one. But it we're talking here about the personal perspective. But you know, what I want to, again, go back to is these are tools that are in the hands of people that do not have uh, your scruples or your scruples, right? Uh, copyright theft is rife. You know, the problem with Spotify is not actually uh, AI generated songs. Uh, the problem is it became a platform, so it no longer licenses music. Now, on the positive side, it opened the platform to self-publishing artists, and that was very important for them. But on the downside, it opened the platform to, you know, drops of rain and things like that. And uh, so now the platform is actually swamped every day by uh, hundreds of thousands of uploads of whatever it is, it's not music. And that's been true ever since it opened up as a platform. So the issue isn't AI generated music, it's the design of Spotify. Apple Music does not have that design. It is a walled garden. It licenses music from source. So, you know, I'm just saying, you know, what is the problem here? The problem isn't AI generated music with respect to Spotify. The problem is the design that Spotify chose to proceed with. And thus, you know, then you say, okay, well, it should be a gatekeeper. It should do this, it should do that. Uh, you know, but the point is, is that, you know, the problem isn't AI generated music on Spotify. That's for sure. It's this platform design. So that's just mm -hmm. a small. Yeah. yeah. And as much as we sort of have consumer power over these types of systems, um, regulation is really important too. And we only have a few minutes left. And so probably not enough to get into all of the regulatory questions here. Um, but I wonder if someone could 
anyone on the panel who wants to take this, um, just give us a, a quick, what do we need to know about the EU's proposed AI Act um, or any other sort of regulatory conversations that are happening right now around bias in AI or AI in general? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can contribute just off the top that only about 32 uh, bills have passed around controlling AI around the world. So it's like super nascent. Um, I want to say that, but I do think uh, linking that and that uh, I'll give somebody else a chance linking that what's happening in Europe from what I see and other spaces in cost like in South America and all kinds of other because we have to remember it's not just women here it's there's all women all around the world in different circumstances that are affected by these things. And um, yeah, I think part of what we need to be doing is not just learning ourselves, that is definitely important, but we have to start uh, organizing again and uh, joining organizations that are out there pressuring governments. And there are organizations here in, in Canada, I'll put some of them in the, in the chat here, and also some international organizations that are doing amazing advocacy work and policy work and coming up with manifestos around what they want to see in policy around AI. So we don't have to invent it here. We can tap into the broader global conversation about this very same thing that are happening amongst women's organizations and groups everywhere. So that would be, um, yeah, I just wanna say, yeah, not very much legislation so far. And I think the whole Elon Musk, like let's put a stop as part of the hype cycle. I mean, come on. Uh, so yeah, just don't think that they're suddenly altruistic and thinking about, well, we built something so badass, we can't even control it. <laughs> I just think that's crazy. Anyway, over to somebody else. Yeah, we you are. Know, um, I, I, so, so I don't know if you guys saw, but the FTC is investigating chat GPT for uh, harm to consumers. So that just came out this, this afternoon. So you know, I mean, this question of harm to consumers is very important. I, I think uh, regulation has to be uh, driven by principles. You know, you don't just have regulation because it's nice to have it like you have a fence around your garden because you need to have a fence around your garden, right? Uh, and so I think that um, the question of regulation and I is still very much an open one. Um, and also, you know, obviously, uh, you mentioned the EU, but the UK has decided to just say, hey, it's it's okay. However, in the UK and in the EU, we have uh, the GDPR, which prevents uh, the deployment of facial recognition. Um, and so, you know, facial recognition is a big application of AI. Mm -hmm. um, on the positive side, uh, there might be great positives here, but the point is, is that so the regime is really privacy, as we call it here, or privacy, as we call it in Canada. <laughs> anyway, so privacy is also a major uh, issue. But so I think facial recognition is is one of those things that is a bedrock, at least in the EU and the UK to date. Uh, I'm not sure what the situation is, but I think there'll be an awful lot of AI tools around that. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have some links for further reading in the chat if you want to if you want to learn more about this, but um, we are out of time. Uh, we could talk about this forever, I'm sure. This has been such a fascinating conversation. So thank you so much to PK, to Dina, to Alice for this conversation, and I'll pass it back to you, Jenna. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kylie, for moderating this incredible conversation. We really bounced around here and had some like incredible points come out. Like I loved the refocused on the fact that this isn't new, that using the term intelligent intelligence makes it hype. And there's hype in all tech products that we want to use, right? That they want to grow their users so that you want to use more of it. And that there is a significant economic value for AI. So it's not going away anytime soon. So thank you for everyone to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for being here. 